the masses are increasingly feeling uprooted, they are delinked, there is a crisis of meaning. And in the absence of meaning that's tied to a collective feeling or myth of what we are and who we are, we have to figure that out. Everyone is told, be an author of your own story. That's impossible. You be our, our cultural and communal beings, and culture is not just throw around words that we have to use to just make things, uh, you know, sell things or make things happen for us. Um, so it's very important to uh, understand that that crisis, the crisis of meaning in society, lends itself to something uh, which we can call identity consciousness and explosion of identity groups. So the identity group becomes a uh, basically a substitute for meaning uh, that you can take very easily just by the color of your skin or your sexual orientation or something else. But that is not real uh, meaning and is not sustainable over the long term of any personal life, which is why we have to constantly change the borders of this, move towards a new direction and create new identities so that the trans identity will be against the feminist identity. It will, it will always move towards that direction because we have to, we also tell people that they have to be able to define these themselves. And even so the boundaries in the, in the identity groups are also themselves not fixed. And finally, a crisis of authority. And this is where the elites come in. If you have a crisis of legitimacy, and liberal democracies everywhere are facing a crisis of legitimacy, you have to, the, these kinds of salvation projects of, of trying to level, the, uh, to level the playing field create a certain, uh, I mean, diversity effectively and difference becomes something to, that's weaponized by the state, by the ruling class, that's able to then say that this is why I need to be in charge so that I can advance this social engineering project. I think so long as the arc of diversity bends towards the equity, diversity will not create an actual pluralistic world of distinctive cultures, but uh, one of conformity and, and, and global homogeneity is actually completely paradoxical to what it wants to create. And both the nationalists and the internationalists, the universalists, are complicit in the language games and the cycles of recognition and denunciation or demonization that diversity agenda works around. Yes, if you talk to a Marxist, or if you talk to a conservative, or if you talk to whatever, um, anybody, with, or a liberal, you know that these people know what kinds of ideas they are in fact defending. So the conversation can be pretty straightforward and interesting and clear, you know. But when you talk to a multiculturalist that happens all the time, you realize that you're confronted with someone who has no idea what kinds of ideas they actually are defending. I'd like you to expand a little bit on why multiculturalism has such a kind of affinity with elite top-down attempts to kind of manage or control society. That there's two different ways of understanding multiculturalism. There's multiculturalism as a lived experience. That's the one that people naively think they're supporting when they say, surely we should live in a multicultural society. They're saying, surely I should be able to live with someone from the Afro, you know, an Afro-Caribbean and enjoy the diversity that that brings to my urban street life. And that's absolutely true, of course. You know, that's, but that, that ship sailed a very long time ago as it happened. You know, my, my, my mother's French, her sister married a black guy from the Caribbean in the 50s when it wasn't really done at all. You know, my brother married a German, which is even more. Um, I'm married to a Chinese Singaporean. My children are really messed up. Um, you know, that, 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 that's part of life, right? Nobody's opposing that. But when people in the elite talk about multiculturalism, that's not what they're talking about, right? What they're talking about is mechanisms to superficially celebrate the diversity of communities but implicitly control how those communities go about doing things. It, in the United Kingdom, it primarily emerged uh, after a period of race riots in the 70s and 80s, when, as I pointed out in my talk, communities didn't matter if they were Hindu or Muslim, they came together to challenge the British government about shitty housing, no jobs, and racial discrimination. And the one thing the government couldn't handle was a united community yeah, um, of many colors, all calling themselves black, interestingly enough. And so they went about saying, well, maybe what we should do to make your life a bit easier is give your community money to build a mosque, your community money to build a Sikh temple, your community money to build an Afro-Caribbean community center. And that was the start of a process 
the divided society. Now, you can look at any British northern town where there, a lot of these communities used to live next to one another, they have become more segregated as a consequence of multiculturalism than they were in the past. And I'll just finish on this point. When the government says, oh, well, what we should do now is kind of, we, we don't like these segregated schools that have emerged where this school appears to be predominantly Muslim and this one appears to be predominantly white. What we want to do is mix everybody up so that everybody can see and celebrate the difference within their community. Can you see what they're doing? They're not saying we should put them together so that they can have a shared educational experience. Education isn't their agenda. It's divide and celebrate differences. You know, you would think you'd put people from all different communities together so that they could see the commonality that they have and have a shared educational curriculum. No, it's about observing that they're all different. But difference is just a fact of life. We're all different in this room. We're all different in this room. Equality, on the other hand, the fact that we all get one vote in an election and we treat each other as moral equals when we go outside, that's not obvious. It's not obvious that we're all equal. And indeed, just two generations ago, we weren't all equal. There was a very strict social hierarchy. Fighting for political equality has been one of the greatest achievements of our times over the last century and a half, and it is being destroyed through the multicultural agenda. We have to understand that uh, multiculturalism is not interested in culture, and that's sort of my major critique of multiculturalism, because if you were, genuine, authentic cultures are formed within uh, you know, more cohesive groups in the first place. They are um, the, effectively a culture for it to be a genuine culture and not be uh, emptied out of its own meaning. Or the shell of itself has to be a monoculture. But in order, the, the world of diversity does, is a world where you have multiple monocultures actually having multiple worldviews, different experiences, different particularities. And this uh, push towards um, you know, uh, universalism is effectively nothing but a kind of hegemony of, or it's, you know, the multicultural in, in some ways stands for a kind of uh, uh, you know, hegemony of the Western um, and Anglo American, in this case. Um, uh, you know, culture, which has, I mean, what, what stands for Anglo-American culture today. So obviously there is so much, we know that there is so much more to the, and part of the reason some of us are here is because we think that there is so much more to the West and to Anglo-American tradition as a tradition. Um, but what we are today in a position where uh, for most of the world, uh, Anglo-Americanism is equivalent to this kind of woke multiculturalist idea. And so that stands for the culture, but it also is a hegemony of these uh, sort of, um, you know, ruling class, this kind of general class of people who think themselves or think of themselves as, uh, you know, enlightened enough to tell every different group an actual authentic root of cultures how to live, whether it's the Chinese, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's uh, the Russians, whether it's the Persians, whether it's the Arabs, it doesn't matter. The point is, this is our values, and I would end on this, Culture, for it to be actually rooted, is never a propositional thing. A propositional culture, like you know, we, we stand for these things, so we are a culture, is almost always, um, you know, uh, first of all, it's very abstract, but almost always lends itself to a kind of ideology. Mm -hmm. So a culture needs to be rooted in practices and customs and, and norms that are historical. I think all of you are a little bit soft on multiculturalism, <laughs> because actually, there is no inherent virtue in multiculturalism at all. It's uh, actually a concept that is self-consciously designed to call into question uniculturalism. It's self-consciously designed to particularly pathologize national cultures. And the reason why multiculturalism emerged is not accidental. It's because uh, a large section of the intelligentsia and of the political elites really hate the nation state and they really want to distance themselves as much as, and if they don't hate it they're ashamed of it and if they're not ashamed of it they feel that it's somehow not right it's not them and i think to that extent Goran, you're wrong to say that people are confused when they like multiculturalism they may not understand what draws them towards multiculturalism because it's uh, often a very semi-conscious or even an unconscious process 
But what is very interesting is that when you scratch the surface and you talk to them, they to a person, whether they're left-wing or, or conservative or liberal multiculturalist, they all make excuses as to why the nation state is morally inferior to a multicultural standpoint. The only the concept that I would use that has got any mileage or virtues is multi-ethnic, because multi-ethnic is at least an honest reflection of reality. That is, the, that is a fact. It's not an ideology, it just recognizes the fact that we live in a world where not all of us are the same. But to, but to move from multi-ethnicity towards multiculturalism is both, as Arthur was saying, to devalue the meaning of culture because it's anti-cultural by definition, but more importantly, it's to ultimately uh, turn national consciousness into a toxic phenomenon, something that you're kind of contaminating. So I would advise that we need to be a bit more ruthless and clear and actually not make the slightest concession to multiculturalism because it's got no redeeming features whatsoever. There's no such thing as a good multiculturalism and, and expose the fact that this is a medium of technocratic control uh, that can only have a negative destructive outcome. 